Hi and welcome to The Jam, the student podcast for City and Islington Sixth Form College. This is the second in the series, The Art That Changed My Life. My name is Ray, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Bristol and today I am come back to talk to these lovely students about the book, The Secret History by Donna Tart. Um, so we'll just start with what brought you to this book and if you could quickly give us a little introduction to yourself too. Hi, my name is Kiwi and I go to City in Islington, obviously, well, obviously. Um, and I came across the book because a friend recommended it to me, but I did have vague knowledge of the book because it's quite popular amongst the art kids and it's <laughs> all over Tumblr and it's quite a iconic sort of mysterious book. Um, yeah, so I started reading it. Well, I read it two years ago, and I thought it was amazing. I thought it was quite good for its, I don't know, for its time. My name is Renee. Um, what brought me to The Secret History was really, at the beginning of the year, I just suddenly got surrounded by the book. Everyone in my history class was reading it. I got, it got recommended to me by my history teacher, Debbie. And um, it was also a big thing on TikTok, as Kiwi said, so yeah. Hi, my name's Alana, and I found the book originally because I was looking for uh, more books to add to my shelf, and it was in a list of uh, important books you should read. So I I gave it a go, and I'm glad I did, because I really enjoyed it. Hello, I'm Debbie, I'm uh, Renee's history teacher and also Lana's um, and also Ray's formerly um, and I teach history and politics at the sixth form and I also set up the jam with some students a few years ago so I'm really happy to be part of this episode. Um, this is one of my favourite books of all time and when I saw Kiwi reading it outside college I got very excited and similarly when Renee had it in the classroom or when other kids had it in the room it was very exciting. Um, I discovered it when I was about 18, 19 and I've come back to it every few years and um, for lots of reasons as a teacher and as a learner uh, this book blows me away and I'm extremely excited to be talking to you about it all today. And I can tell that this book is intensely recommendable. <laughs> I've probably recommended it to most of the people I know at this point, and thank God I had it recommended to me on a very hectic last COVID day of the year when Debbie thrust it into my hand in the candy library and said, you had to read this. And it was amazing, very formative when I was reading it. And with the chaos of lockdown, it definitely helped me through into my early year at university too. So. It's great we've all found it, now we're going to have a, a nice discussion about it. So, we'll talk a lot about character, I imagine, but let's just start off by asking, who did you relate to most, and maybe tell us a little bit about why. Um, so, this is Kiwi speaking, and I, now thinking about it, I think I related to Camilla the most. I, I thought it was powerful that she was, you know, the only woman in the group, and she was this very vulnerable character and at the time I was reading it I was also this young teen and I, well I said I'm a teen but I was this you know, young, I felt quite vulnerable and I just, I was studying I was planning to study classics um, so I found that I resonated with her so much and especially you know when she was having, I feel like she was outcasted quite a bit like you sort of, when you were reading the book, you saw that she was going off into her own little trail of thoughts, and I thought that was quite beautiful, and yeah, I, I related to her quite a bit. Um, Renee here. I related quite closely with Richard, of all of the characters, because just while I was reading the book, I was in a moment in my life where I was sort of every every which way I didn't know where I really fit in and one part of the book really resonated with me where Richard said that he wanted to remind the world that he did exist and that was sort of my thought process when I was reading the book so I related really closely with Richard and also Francis in the sense that he he tries to get he tries to get a laugh out of a serious situation so Francis also. It's Alana and I feel similarly to Renee I think I relate 
to Richard the most, um, sort of feeling a little bit like an outcast in certain groups and um, not quite fitting in, I guess. I think it's, it's interesting. I'm going to cheat a little bit and say I can draw from all of them in their own ways, but um, definitely in my early stages of university, I felt this intense need to fit in, to fit in academically, to fit in socially, and that's something I think really rings with Richard's character, as Alana was saying. Um, Camilla was an interesting choice, and <laughs> I think it's definitely important to have a little conversation about gender, because... I think maybe at the start Camilla might seem powerful in her alluring of Richard, but by the end that's really broken down. I mean, what do you guys think? Yeah, 100%. It's Kiwi speaking, and um, I think that in the beginning everybody would probably think that Camilla was the one who had this stronghold on everyone, and she was, like you said, Rosa, she was this powerful character and she was very charismatic and mysterious and you know the only woman in the group it makes you want to find more out about her um but i do think that there is a strong sense of vulnerability and weakness and she herself knows that she knows that while she has this hold in everyone she also is this lonely and insecure you know, person who's going through all this stuff, which you don't find out till till the end. Um, but yeah, she. It's interesting because I think a lot of there's a poem by Sappho, which is an ancient Greek poem. It's called um, "Come Close," I think. I hope. <laughs> um, but in that book, Sappho is like one of the main mother. Of Greek poetry, and she does fiddle with, uh, I think she fiddles with gender fluidity a lot, and what it's like to be a woman, and, you know, being the only woman in a group, and I think that sort of reflects here, when Camilla is just going about her actions and her business in the story. Yeah, and being the only woman, you know, she sticks out like a sore thumb, Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think about that choice? I think it was an interesting choice and I also think that it was really easy to make a villain out of Camilla right away because she was sort of this, the, the only woman in the group, all of the boys seemed to want her. and Including her brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was just really easy to like, pinpoint her as... Like all of the all of these problems are happening, and somehow Camilla rings into all of them. And yeah, generally, <clears throat> Camilla plays smaller parts in what we might think are like larger scenes in the book. For example, um, the death of Bunny, which we're going to talk about. I think actually Camilla is much more in the background for those scenes. But as a woman, we kind of. We, we do cast her straight away as a temptress and, mm-hmm. and we want her to be a bigger part of the action than maybe she actually is. And in terms of the, the murder of Death Bunny coming onto that, would you say, how did you feel about that scene? What did it say to you? Um, at first, I thought it was a bit underwhelming for me when I, when I first read it. Um, I thought it was sort of like... You know, these group of intelligent kids and they're, you know, they have this mysterious energy about them and, and they're, you know, they're always, you, in, throughout the book, they're always planning intricately and, you know, causing lots of mischief. But hmm. I just, you know, when it got to the bit where Bunny was murdered and they just pushed him off a cliff or whatever it was, I was, it was a bit abrupt for me back then and I thought... You know, I wanted more, I wanted... Because at one point in the book, they were studying uh, botany. They were looking at mushrooms and seeing if there's any way they could poison Bunny with some mushrooms. But that they didn't follow through with that. And when it got to the bit, they, like I said, they just pushed him off the cliff. And only now I realise how that impulsive decision comes into play with the whole rhythm of the book because 
essentially they are all children. They're all, you know, they, they don't know what they're doing as academically intelligent as they are. They don't mm. know, they don't understand the depth of murder and the depth of a lot of things. They've just, all they know is their, their, their own group and studying classics. Um, so I think it was a good way to, I mean, good way to to follow through with the murder. It, it was quick and it was childish and that's what they are. They're, you know, I, throughout the whole book I only saw them as children grappling with murder. I guess it reflects, I'm just, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about the fact that that death is, that's the panic, that's the panic murder, right? Because yeah. they've done this elaborate, um, people that haven't read the book, spoilers coming, you know, they have this like enormous kind of bacchanalia that's, encouraged by their teacher I guess we'll talk about yeah. that in a sec um, and ends with them um, murdering someone in like the woods like a farmer and so when Bunny gets wise to it right so it feels like that's the kind of the panicky death they're not planning on doing which is why it kind of fits maybe that it's so sort of yeah like childlike and clumsy mm. and all the rest of it but I guess we're also sort of thinking about like with the, the mushrooms and stuff that this Julian the teacher is therefore not responsible and I wonder, I guess we'll talk about this more, but I think he's responsible for the first death, but not Bunny's. I've only just thought that now, but I, yeah. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really like how that sort of the messiness of the murder contradicts with their sort of... Um, the way they're trying to present themselves and hmm. their exterior to the world. Um, how they, they dress so smartly and act so sort of prestigious but this sort of clumsy messy murder was sort of very much childlike just put it pushing someone over it sounds like something that might happen in a playground mm. um yeah i really like how that con- contrasts with their exterior um that they present with people and i think that um this is a kind of running theme from the, our conversation as maybe at the start of the novel we see these characters as fully formed adults with sophistication and knowledge and maybe we look up to them as much as Richard does as these kind of almost unearthly geniuses but by the end they're just a bunch of kids pushing each other around right and waving guns and being chaotic (laughs) just like toddlers in a playground and that is really Donald Trump maybe pulling back the curtain on on this world of elitism and academia that feels so inaccessible to the mass general public. Yeah, can I just say also it was really easy for me to see them, all of the characters, directly for their trauma, which is interesting because when you think about like the psychology of humans, someone's trauma affects a person so much it affects the decisions they make and you know how they treat people and how they allow themselves to be treated and it just you you see it so it's so distinct within each of the characters like maybe even Richard like he he might you I guess you could say it's arguable that he was completely oblivious to the fact that he might have been he had a biased opinion on someone like Camilla or Charles or even Bunny but yeah yeah and going on to kind of what Debbie was saying you know if these are children struggling with trauma and becoming adults where does that put Julian Hmm. as their teacher I mean we'll discuss Julian's character and and what we think of him but just generally you know Julian opens the door to Richard. He is mm. he welcomes him into this this clique who is actually quite ambivalent towards him at first. Um and is Julian the real puppet master, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Is he the one setting them up for all this catastrophic chaos and murder? What do you think? I think that's a really good point and especially because he's not even mentioned that much in the book he doesn't play a big part in terms of the story it would make more sense for him to have that underlying influence on all of them because as we mentioned before then they, they are all kids and even the symbolism of him being like the father figure and him him kind of 
being their teacher and teaching them stuff and it, it would make sense that he you know was pulling the strings and also while reading the book I felt as though Julian had like he sort of morbidly wanted it to happen and we see this a lot like when they're searching for Bunny's body he compares it to his was it Theodore Dostoevsky he compared it to a crime and punishment scene. I think it's Tolstoy. He like looks at the snow. He's mm. like, it's so beautiful. Yeah. But I think you're right that it pulls on like Russian yeah. themes yeah, the and, dark and literature. Kind of aura. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he also, again, with all of these children that have trauma, he brings them all into a room completely unsupervised and just projects onto them every single day. <laughs> Something like this was bound to happen and I feel like he wanted it to because he has this, such an obsession with with art and just performance in general and I think he wanted to see something grand play out in real life. Yeah, I think um, especially Julian's want of the group to be so unsupervised and exclusive and only under his influence it seems he definitely was trying to project or in influence these these characters into well maybe committing the murders but that's not yeah can i just ask a question as a teacher to students do teachers have that much power control uh, influence over young minds? I mean, like, genuinely open question. Like, yeah, I, th- uh-huh. I, th- I think they do, to a certain extent. I'm, I'm not sure... I guess it depends on, on, on the relationship you have with your teacher. Like, for me, I have to... I have to make it a thing where I have a good relationship mm-hmm. with all my teachers and I, you know, I know them like friends, so because it helps me learn better. Mm-hmm. And I guess if it gets to that, then... It, it would make sense that a teacher would have an impact on the way you see things in the same way your mother would have an impact on the way you see things. But I do think it's also possible to have like a fine line between you know, having your own views. And, I mean, it really depends, like, because it, the characters in The Secret History, although they're so, like, these great masterminds, they're really, really... They're, all of them are really vulnerable. Mm-hmm. They, they don't. None of them know what they're really doing. They they seem to only have one goal, and they don't. You, I don't. When I was reading, it, I didn't see them think anything outside of that. And I think it's easy for anybody to influence someone like that. I think with the point about Julian being sort of parental, it's also going to be heightened in the situation that they're in, which is boarding school. And they're living in that educational environment. He is the closest um, figure they have to, I guess, a parent. Um, they see him every day and they interact with him and him only as a teacher. So I think definitely that's why he might have had such a large impact on them. Yeah, also the fact that I don't, if I recall, I don't think any of them had that close relationships with their parents. Mm-hmm. So it would have like you said, big impact. Yeah. I think in answer to your question, how how influential are teachers? Well, I'd say when you're a toddler, you know, teachers <laughs> influence you with the ABCs, but by the time you get to 19, 20, these, these grand beacons <laughs> of knowledge are influencing you with ideas, and that's so much more powerful because at that age, all you want is is ideas. You want to know where you fit in and how you fit in and what you think and why you think it. And if it's just one teacher, as Alana was saying, saying, well, this is what you think and this is how you think it, then, of course, that's going to rub off in a massive way. And I think we have thrown the word cult around even, you know, this, this grand leader, and he's feeding these young, vulnerable minds these ideas. But could we say that about, you know any classics teachers I mean he's just teaching them the content really so do we think Julian is more active in his uh, intentions I think so especially with Henry in particular because Henry before he 
I think before he even stepped foot into Julian's class, he had this injury with his head and he was very vulnerable, doesn't have a good relationship with his family. And then Julian there taking him out to dinner and mm. they even speak to each other in Greek. Mm. And it's like they have this connection that no one else in the class shares with each other. And it's very, it's interesting, but very irresponsible for a teacher to do such a thing with a vulnerable student. But if he is going to do this, he understands the influence, he understands the risks. Mm. Where is he at the end, once all is said and done? Where is Julian? Where's the, the lesson? Where's the punishment or the reward? I mean, <laughs> this, is a, this is a parental figure, this is a teacher, this is an influencer. He wields this power, but where's the accountability? What do you think? Well, he nef- left no trace, I guess. So, hidden, which is, I don't know what was going to happen to the rest of them, or how, I mean, their lives are ruined, right? Whether they get called in or not, which they won't. Even with Henry's funeral, he just, at the end of it, he sounds so powerless. In his text message, he's like, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, and that's where he leaves it, and that's the last we hear of him. It's like, where, where are you, really? It's pretext, no? It must be a letter. It, 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 it can't be text. <laughs> I think it is a but no, I mean, oh, it, it is a letter. It's, but but I am. Um, yeah, ninety two. It was written. Mm, yeah. But but obviously, I get where you're coming <laughs> from. You know. Yeah. But it's it's not it's not a great story for him, is it? He's the master, and he wants to tell a story with his puppets, and then. He doesn't even get to end it. He just disappears. Do you think do you think Tart was being intentional there? Do you think she's trying to send us a message about how power and influence always breaks down eventually? Or is it is she just telling a story with a character who bit off more than he could chew? Right. I don't know if this is being really naive, but does he we is he responsible for Bonnie's death? Is that what we've agreed? Like, is he really? I'm not. I'm not defending him. I'm just trying to understand what you're saying, Ray, and whether he he does care for Bunny, you know. And there's a sense of you know when you said it before, like opening the door to Rich, like you know, we say, Richard, run, don't don't go in, you know. But this is this established group, and Bunny's a part of it, and he's a bit whatever, not as um, not as gifted as the others, and you know, whatever, privileged, lazy, da da da, but. Does Richard, does Bunny, is that, is that really Julian's fault? Or is that just an incredibly I mean, naive question? I feel like he knew what he was doing mm-hmm. from the beginning. You know, he's not, he's certainly not stupid. You know, mm-hmm. he's, he knows the impact that he, he has on these kids from the very beginning, from, you know, from the time that they entered the classroom, so... I'm not sure, like, he was shocked when Bunny died, obviously, but I feel like that shock stemmed more from the shock of murder than the shock of... I I just thought he knew it was coming eventually. I think he's responsible if you take into into account that he, he created... Henry, sort of. So, <laughs> if if Henry's copying the master, then is Julian really responsible? And I, I, I suppose so in a way. I'm not sure. Just. I think if someone was to defend Julian, I mean, you could say that he didn't give them a knife or he didn't push <laughs> yeah. them into the woods. You know, they went there of their own will. Um, however, his he, he may have gotten into their subconscious and mm-hmm. influenced all of those decisions. So it's a difficult one. I think there is definitely something to be said, like what you were saying, Anna, about you know the actors and the bystanders. Is Julian a bystander? Possibly he allows it to happen. He doesn't take action after it's happened. But it would be... 
maybe a bit of an understatement to say he just, you know, he didn't have much to do with it. He was just on the sidelines. Um, and while we're on the subject of bystanders, I think we need to talk about Richard um, mm. as a character, as a narrator. Do we trust him? Is he telling us the whole story? Is he telling the story right? I think it's like... I think it's easy to feel like Richard was not telling an accurate story because um, there is this chain, food chain sort of link because he had this obsession with Camilla and that would influence his perception of Charles and Francis and, 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 and the rest of them. So it's, it's easy to think that he, he would have been telling a one-sided story but I think Debbie mentioned earlier that they that he was obsessed with everyone sort of he had this obsession with the whole group and keeping the group together and you know just this fetishized idea of everybody studying classics and just you know doing what they wanted to do I don't know weird perverse stuff. <laughs> Um, I also think Donald Hart made an intentional choice in making, in bring, pulling attention to Richard's fatal flaw at the very beginning of the book, which is a morbid, a morbid longing for the picturesque. Mm -hmm. And I think that just plays into everything Richard says from then on, and he makes these people probably sound way more sophisticated than they are. And it's sort of, he's really interesting because. He's so desperate to be a part of this that he ties himself into a murder that had nothing to do with him. And I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there is definitely an aspect of Richard wanting to be in on a secret. And he's so desperate that he paints these figures. He, he tells the story for himself, really, so he can unpick it. But once he has, what are we left with, right? some murderers mm. and Richard standing there bewildered and having basically no idea what to do. I was just thinking Renee, when you were talking about yeah just what, you know what he wants and what he's looking for and just re remembering all those scenes where he you know with his with his roommate or the the woman next door Judy or when he goes to those sort of kind of druggy parties and suddenly there's just this other world that's far more um for all its um, transgressions it's it's clean and it's sanitized and it's safe right and he's he could have had that life right and he, and he doesn't and that to me like the, he's narrating there's different stories that could have happened in this book and he's narrating unfortunately the darkest one but that he's chosen on some level right from this vulnerable position you where know, he's on the other side of the country Go, like you say, you know, it's like the equivalent of boarding school, exactly, just shut away and cut off. And um, I don't know. I don't know whether he will regret it, actually. Now I think about it, maybe this is, maybe this is his life fulfilled. I don't, I don't think Richard actually feels bad. Because right. In, there was that scene with Henry while he was p pulling on the plants and he's turns to Richard and says, you don't really care much for other people, do you? Mm. And Richard doesn't deny it in any way. And it's sort of like, he, he defends himself a lot and says he doesn't see himself as a bad person. And sort of like, he's completely detached himself. And I think that also circles back to, you know the characters being like children because not a lot of children <laughs> empathize with you know other people's actions this is sort of like it's like i don't know like a child stepping on a snail and just not really thinking about <laughs> that it's a it's a thing that's alive um yeah you see that with richard a lot like he's just he doesn't understand his actions and he doesn't understand why he's doing what he's doing but he's just doing it for the sake of it I think coming back to, to that beautiful quote from the start of the book, you know, <laughs> the obsession with the picturesque, the whole book is, it invites you into this wonderful cinematic world. I mean, do we think that this is 
a world of complete fantasy? Does this exist? Could this only exist in, in fiction and literature? I think Tart has done an amazing job at making it this sort of cinematic masterpiece because down to the tiny details, the way it's written, it's so poetic. It's like it has so much rhythm and so much flavour. And it's very, very similar to a lot of um, classical literature and classical poems. Um, and it's sort of it's sort of like how a lot of a lot of books, modern and you know old classics, they mention Icarus because you know everybody remembers the story of Icarus. It's it's so iconic. It's it's sort of it's sort of like that when you read phrases in this book, you just you just remember it and you just you just think, you know, that's the most beautifully formed <laughs> sentence ever. And it does invite you, it, it invites you to like it want makes you want to know more about, you know, what's going to happen, wants to makes you want to continue reading and going deeper into the story. And yeah. And sorry, to, but going back into the cinematic stuff um, there's a good book called The Dreamers and it's also a film um, and Charles and Camilla's relationship is reflected in that type of incestuous way which is also seen in, in, in the film and in the book The Dreamers um, and it's interesting that when you look at it, if you take a film, normally films tend to romanticise things and tend to make it look really raw and artistic and, you know, you don't actually weigh the impact mm. of how some a relationship like that could be damaging and could literally change your whole life. But when you read this book, it's... it's when you find out what's happened between Charles and Camilla, you... it's... It has a weird, weird impact on your brain. It makes you feel really, like, slimy, which is interesting because a film wouldn't necessarily do that. You know, a film is, I think you mentioned before, like, it's just in front of your face. You don't actually go through the impact of finding out the tiny details mm. about their life. It's just thrown in your face, so, yeah. I mean, in answer to your question... Yeah, the, I think fact two, like, I don't, I don't think it's just in fiction. What I, I mean, two thoughts. One, um, it's intriguing that there hasn't been a film made of this, and yeah. I'm probably glad about that, and we talked about that earlier, you know, sort of what left to the imagination, but it would make for a cracking film in the right hands, I think. <laughs> but um, also just the lack of morality, and when you were just talking before, like, Richard doesn't care, and I was just thinking, well, God, what if he doesn't care? Then there's no moral compass. And I was trying to just think, as we're talking about equivalence, in literature or film, and you mentioned Dostoevsky, there's probably the closest, like, crime and punishment, which I know is sort of, you know, it's a big influence with a Tart, but just, yeah, lack of morality is... That's a very disturbing feature of this book, I think. Oh, definitely. Um, I have to agree with that. And I think going on to whether we make a good film, I'll ask <laughs> you two to, to give your, your sense on that one next. But um, I, the whole experience reading this book, me it was like you know standing on this crazy mm. distorted snow globe or, mm. almost like totally <laughs> yeah. immersed and trapped and claustrophobic and covered in snow that's that's what it came down to for me and it, it's it like the russians be, right yeah exactly <laughs> and it would just it would have to be the right right hands to make this film do you guys think it would translate i I'm not sure because in right now the book's really taken off and I feel like a lot of stuff would be glamorised that shouldn't be glamorised in the book and also I I'm not sure how they would translate the thoughts really I think we talked about this earlier a lot of a lot of thinking happens in the book and you can't really make a, a character say it because then they lose that character and it's I'm not sure I think the secret history is better as a standalone <laughs> thing <laughs> yeah I'm um, similar I'm quite happy with it um, just as a book to enjoy the reading experience um, perhaps if it was going to be made into any sort of other form 
then to be able to translate the thoughts um, and the characters' feelings, then maybe theatre or play for the reason of that they have a soliloquy, a soliloquy um, where the characters can express their feelings to the audience um, just like how they might do it as a narrator in a book but, but without the other characters knowing their feelings. I mean, I was just thinking, totally, a player would love... I'm sure they've been, I'm sure, like, Edinburgh or something, that this stuff exists, but, Renee, as you were talking, I was thinking, yeah, it would have to be, like, pre-internet, right? Like, that's, that's a difficult world. Like, the, the campus is so enclosed um, to have it... Like, when you sort of made that reference to, like, a text message before, it's like, wait, no, 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 no. But that would work on the stage. You could, you could get away with it. But actually, a, a modern contemporary... Because it feels still contemporary, this book, which yeah. is remarkable, given that it's, yeah, 30 years old right now. Mm -hmm. So having, you'd have to insulate it against um, social media because they couldn't have got away with this today, <laughs> right? It would have been all over everything. So I would love it. I'd love to see. I'd love to see that on the stage. That'd be amazing. Um, so we're kind of coming to the end of our discussion now. Um, and I think we've talked a lot about responsibility and accountability, but I'm going to leave you with one of the, this open-ended question. Who's to blame? Who's taking most of the brunt of this, of this responsibility? Do you want to have a crack at it? I think... I found myself sort of blaming Camilla in a sense that, like I mentioned before, she had this weird grip on everyone and, you know, she... It was very easy for her to just kind of pull one string and, and you know, change everyone's opinion and change everyone's decisions. But now thinking about it, Julian seems like you know, the person to be blamed here. I, I think, again, going off, like, talking about, like, psychology and stuff, mm -hmm. you don't really, you don't blame a child for the way they're acting, you blame mm -hmm. the way they're brought up. And it's, it would be the same for Julian. Like, Julian had the biggest impact on all of them. You know, he sort of raised them, because the parents, as I said before, don't play a big part in this story. And... If we we're going to look at why they did what they did, why they bur murdered Bunny, I think Julian's, it's fair to blame him, to be honest. He was the responsible adult <laughs> in quotation marks. I think everyone sort of plays a role, even Bunny himself in a way. Yes. Yeah, because he's just... Who would take jabs at people who are capable of murder sort of thing? And also, I guess, in a way, Richard also definitely plays a role. For the short amount of time he spent with this group, he's... When Bunny told him everything that happened, he called the group and said, he's told us we have to do it. And it's sort of like... Everyone contributed to it in a way, but when it... as Kiwi said it really comes back to how they were brought up and they were they were forced into this environment with Julian. Yeah, I would agree and say that none of these characters really had any morals and mm. you know, Julian was the nearest figure who could have been helping them grow and teaching them the right ways and the wrong ways really. Um, and he didn't so Julian is at the top of who, the list of who to blame. Yeah, I guess if you're looking for moral character in a teacher, you yeah, know, in its yeah. purest sense, that's what the teacher is there for, then Julian falls short. Can I also blame Donna Tart? <laughs> she's <laughs> created this <Right>. hellhole. <laughs> what, what do you think, Ray? Oh, I mean, <laughs> again, I think placing blame on one person would be foolish in this. Mm this novel because every single character is crafted in such a way where they have good and bad and maybe none of them meant to do it maybe all of them meant to do it 
and we'll we'll never know. So yeah, I think Donna's heart is the is the biggest culprit here for making <laughs> us all so confused. Um, so I think we'll we'll come to the end of our discussion there. It's been great. You've been listening to the second episode in the series The Art That Changed My Life. And you've been listening to the Jam Podcast, the student podcast sitting in Islington Sixth Form College. Goodbye.